Okay, so welcome back to our second part on interdisciplinary projects. Um, and welcome Caroline Bohlmann on stage. Caroline Bohlmann is teaching conservation and restoration of modern and contemporary art at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. She was part as conservator at Documenta 10 and Kunstmuseum Wolfsburg and since 2000 is the conservator of modern and contemporary art at Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. Her research focus lies on the intersection of art history and conservation of contemporary and ephemeral art and on the materiality in modern and contemporary art and media. Today she will talk about artist Dieter Roth, who we already heard about, whose oeuvre is known for, you could say, rotting and fluid processes for growing installations, uh, the interweaving of life and objects, of plants and animals, and for expanding the categories of fine art to include time and chance. So, Caroline, please tell us more. Thank you very much, Eve, and thank you to everyone of the Rotting Sounds Project for the invitation to be here today. In my understanding, uh, Dieter Roth acts as a kind of a godfather for this fantastic project, Rotting Sounds, and um, the more I deal with it, with it the more I, I'm convincing this seems to me. In the following, I will try to introduce Dieter Roth, the Swiss artist, to you and describe how I envision him yeah, as the idea of a godfather for the Rotting Sounds project. Um, Dieter Roth's work is characterized by numerous transformation processes and media changes in terms of material, time and actors. The range of media and materials in his work and production processes reflects the many experimental, experimental approaches that have characterized his artistic work in the last decades of the 20th century. Books, poetry, photographs, prints, drawing, films, concert recordings, videos, multiples and archives, uh, I mean every, nearly everything. In the course of his artistic work, the media changes expand to include the aspect of the ongoing and the ephemeral. Growth and change determine the genesis of Dieter Roth's installation, some of which are room filling. Added to these are the fluid material processes that still continue to exist. The growing installations, the interweaving of life and objects of plants, animals and museum, and the performative elements are all part of his work. And at the same time, often develop sim simultaneously. One of his well-known quotes describe the openness and the intended reception of his work very good. Quotation, don't bother my collaborators. Moss, worms and bread beetles are my assistants and they have to do their work like we do. Quotation finish. Dieter Roth hereby expands the category of work to include time and chance and completely different actants, stakeholders and co-players. The lecture addresses this cycle that knows no remains and record all of life as a kind of transmedial self-observation, especially of, to his own biography. Not only does he involve himself in these processes, but also the viewer, the assistants, his family, or the co-producer. These self-perpetuating working processes involve nearly everything fellow performers as well as also material and surrounding. They document Dieter Roth himself and at the same time create their own archiving, production and reception. Felicitas Thun wrote, quotation, the artwork in Dieter Roth's work mutates from a production aesthetically closed object to a performative reception aesthetic and transparent artistic process. This also applies to the Rotting Sound project in so far as I understood, the genesis of the work and the processes of writing it down are not completed. They remain visible and transparent to, yeah, for the viewer. As with Dieter Roth's works, the exhibited works are subject to long-term transformation processes, depending on their surroundings, the materials used, and env environmental influences. In Dieter Roth's 
extremely extensive oeuvre. The dimension of transmedia and transparent recording can be followed like a red thread. The practices of these are writing, introspection, media change, processuality and archiving. They intertwin, exist simultaneously and refer to each other in this work. And I would like to present you in the next minutes um, a few examples of his work. I will begin with writing and books. And Dieter Roth came from bookmaking, from book art, and allow me a brief view on his biography to understand better yeah, what his background was. Dieter Roth was born in Hannover in 1930 to a German mother and a Swiss father and grew up in Zurich. He had an education as a graphic artist in Bern and from 1948 onwards, he was taught various graphic subjects such as design, lettering, lithography, printing, etching technique at the local trade school in Bern. In 1953, Roth founded the magazine Spirale, an important organ of concrete art together with Eugen Gomringer and Marcel Wyss. With Wyss, he also opened a gallery called Gallery 33, a platform for exhibition, film and concert of the art scene at that time. In the course of his life, he published more than 500 books. Quantity instead of quality was one of his often quoted principles. And when asked whether he preferred his books or objects, he replied, the books, that's where I can cry, that's where I can rant. The medium of books and writing therefore permanence his entire oeuvre with the most diverse printmaking processes you can imagine. This becomes particularly clear in his diaries, which he kept like a catalogue raisonné, already in view of his own catalogue raisonné. For him, writing is an almost material process in which a writing instrument deposits the movement of the hand or the body as a trace on a carrier surface. It rather becomes a notation, but at the same time also, also individuates, creates deviation and expands structurally and semantically. So, you have a little image by him, and I will go on to his writings. But what is written also become artistic material. Starting from writing and graphics, he developed these elements further, and he knows no semantic or material boundaries. Words become images, written characters like commata or commas become signs, as you see there in this um, Dieter Roth book, Just with Commatas and then he transformed them to objects with nails as commatas with so-called um, rubber band pictures. He develops new perspective on what he has found, what he has thrown away, on leftovers and remains, but he brings them into connection with ex existence and life, and in turn places them into new context. Perhaps you know these um, literary sausages by Dieter Roth. Roth's treatment of what he has found ranges, ranges from explicit references to other authors and artists to the production of literary sausages that are stuffed with the books instead of meat, whose titles they then bear. So this is how the works of, for example, Georg Wilhelm, Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Werk in 20 Volumen von 1974, or Günter Grass, Die Blechtrommel, and the processing of the German author Martin Walser, whom he doesn't admire very much. Roth also practices this procedure transmedial pictures, those become as much material for his artistic artwork as texts or magazines. Roth signs his art recipes giving it the character of an artwork and using a form from various conceptual artists were also practicing at this time. So this is, let, allow me to, qu to quote this. This is a little recipe by him, a quotation, print until you can't stand it anymore or until you don't want anymore. Take away for binding, for instance, the sheets which with the machine cannot take anymore torn, wrinkled, or beautiful according to someone's taste. Don't throw anything away. As soon as you can't stand this anymore, have another recipe. If you can't stand anything anymore, give it up. If you don't want to give it up, go on until you can't stand it anymore. D.R. By signing these instructions or recipes, 
He connects the idea with the realized work as an equal. The procedure is reminiscent for the statements like, for example, the conceptual artist Lawrence Wiener. But while Lawrence Wiener left the performers of his idea and concepts free to choose the material and to choose the place, Roth was always very much allied to the materiality and the cycle of his production and yeah, accompanying the production. The understanding of artistic work as a compilation of the found, the biographical, in order to create something new from it is a central aspect of his work. The understanding of artistic work as a form in the bringing together and the compilation, the accumulation combinatories plays a continuous role in his production. After filling sausages, casings with books, described as I described above, he also filled book pages, for example, with meat or with uh, vanilla cream and urine, as you see right above. In addition to the publications executed in the conventional format of the book, however, there are also, for example, these preferential editions that appear to accompany the edition in, y in which he printed the PVC bags with writing, filled with individual pages, yeah, with the cream, or with fat, or even with mut mut mutton. We have a similar work of Dieter Roth here in Vienna in our atelier for current conservational research, actually next to Almut's place in the academy. Despite their unusual material composition, these works are still strongly attached in the written and printed. But um, later, the range of Dieter Roth's use of material is becoming more diverse, and with the work Snow he worked on during his stay in Philadelphia, he's also reacting more and more to everyday material and found objects. Snow was created over a period of several months in 1964 and was an important turning point in Roth's practice. All the material was created by the artist rather than taken from printed sources or mass media, and in its heterogeneous jumble of form and writing rather than nearly cut and bound volume as in earlier works we saw before. The content is cryptic and personal, offering a glimpse into his exuberant mind, we could say. This is a quotation, this is a citat by him during he uh, he worked on snow. Quotation, I photographed everything, he says. People and objects that were all knobby and letterboxes and what caught my eye. Every evening I took everything I had touched that day, absolutely everything I had touched in, in terms of paper, whether it was drawings, sketches, photographs or just the paper I had whipped the printing plates with. I spread it all out and pinned it on big boards covered with stretch fabric. And after three months of work, I had about 2,000 things. I stapled about 200 or 300 of these things together to make one big book. Quotation finish. Verbal formulae are presented like mathematical equations without solutions. They are references to Roth's new experiments with fainting doodles and sketches are taped to printed sheets creating multi-layered flaps and they are notes and diagrams. As well, as a tiny still life, you see here, um, made of wax with a light bulb. In 1969, Roth designed the chairs and the table to store um, the snow work as well. Gathering everyday things, reflecting of the objects, re recording the events, holding on to and retrieving them becomes a characteristic feature of Dieter Roth's practice, as I said. Beatrice von Bismarck describes this in an essay on Roth's self-archiving practice. In the back and forth of Roth's bodily actions, so movements and decision-making, even throwing things away becomes a creative act in which, again, quite production-related feelings are mixed. Self-observation, this takes place not only in writing and describing, but on many levels. So, above all more and more through what falls away and arises in daily life. The German word Abfall is really 
yeah, perfect for this image. In 1978, Roth started collecting every piece of household waste he had produced himself that was not thicker than three or four millimeters. He bought these pieces together in the installation Flacher Abfall and presented them within transparent sleeves in chronological sorted folders. Dieter Roth also understand this collection of words, Flacher Abfall, as a form of diary, and he also spoke about a self-portrait of himself from this year. Here you can see this um, rubbish, not bigger than three millimeters. In this installation, Roth collected and ar archived his flat rubbish and byproducts for exactly one year. He collected and documented this waste, such as invoices and brochures, placed them in clear um, plastic sheets and file borders and turn filled them in filling cabinets before he organized all these very bureaucratic like this and then he came in these big things. The presentation appeared very reduced as well as documentary and visually reminiscent of works by Onkavara or Hanne Darboven and also a little bit like for Christian Boltanski. The folders functioned as a kind of diary and could be consulted by the visitors. The artist consciously incorporates the paradox of collecting into his work. Immaterial memories are preserved in the form of material waste. The work explicitly emphasizes the autobi autobiographical moment. Rubbish on every day, completely banal object, is elevated to the state of something special. The work also reflects Roth's deconstruction of the conventional concept of an autographic work and instead emphasizes the processual nature of artistic work. This process, here self-testimony and life process, traces a kind of topography of everyday life with, which demonstrate the performative reception aesthetic and transparent design process of work. The self-observation remains the important and continuous theme of his work, so why safe observation becomes self-documentation, for example, in his solo scene. This video installation, solo scene, was created in the end of the 1990s, and during a, a convalescence day in Iceland and Basel, Roth filmed his domestic life with a fixed camera, and one gains both an intimate and banal insight into his daily activities. We see the artist eating, reading, washing himself, and sometimes he's not even in the picture, but the tape continues to run. The film material is presented on 128 video screens in three wooden racks, and it's difficult to keep one's eye on a monitor because there are so many. The accumulation of the waste of material plays just as much a role here as the breaking down of the boundary between art and life. The opposition between the special and the trivial is brought into synthesis in his subsequent works. He extends this practice even more excessively to material observation and process. For him, changeability is part of life and also development and process, in which he did not intervene in a corrective way, leaving the objects to decay, to rotting, creating so-called works of demise, as he called them. So I come now to um, the garden sculpture or the garden installation by Dieter Roth. And it's, um, it's a work I know very, very, very good because I um, was planting, gardening, taking care about this work about more than um, 60 years, perhaps in the Hamburger Bahn, in the Hamburger Bahn of the Museum for Contemporary Art in Berlin. At the beginning of everything, the whole garden sculpture, Roth created this multiple, perhaps you know this from books about him, the so-called A Portrait of the Artist as a bird seed bust. Also the deutsche Titel is The Portrait of the Artist as a Vogelfutter Büste. It's a mixture. An ironic commentary and literary criticism on the novel A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce, which the artist found particularly kitschy. Dieter Roth portrayed himself as an aged old artist or poet in the tradition of a bust. The sculpture, which is about only 20 centimeters high, represents a clear contrast to traditional forms. 
He plays with the subject of the cl classical bust, which embodies the habitus, state, and dignity of statesmen, poets, philosophers, and intended to preserve them for eternity. But in this bust, on the other hand, consists a mixture of chocolate and birdseed, mounted on an approach board and placed in a garden. The sculpture is thus made of a material that is perishable anyway and is also actively shaped by external influences. Roth created this anti-monument, which, like himself, was the mercy to the natural process of becoming and passing away and ran the risk of not outlasting the artist. The bust formed the nucleus for a body of work that continued to profilerate and grow. Over time, the work expanded into a garden sculpture that was in constant flux. Now elements and details were added. The garden sculpture is a big organism. It was not limited in the location or space, but moved several times. So, yeah, anyway, I will show you now. I, I show you for, no, for a moment this growing sculpture to get an idea about what I'm speaking. So it was growing from two meters in 20, 30 years on to 40 meters. But I go back to the, yeah, to the beginning, and to the production. Because it was an artistic, yeah, it, um, he planned it together with Rudolf Rieser, which was his colleague and his printer in his garden in Cologne. But it was not only in the garden of Rudolf Riese. Rudolf Riese got these letters by Dieter Ruth and with all the instruction how to, how to build and how to start it. And um, perhaps what is interesting that um, this, um, so for example, he writes him in, I think in the middle of winter in January or I can't remember really, uh, this kind of instruction. The wood should perhaps be around six centimeters thick and it's welcome to be cheap, brittle, bouncy, crappy. You don't have to saw out the chips exactly, it's allowed to be quite baggy or floppy. This painting can also be blotchy just as the person concerned or just in the mood has it. Because at the same time they start to collect paintings, aquarelles, framed things into this garden sculpture in the winter time. So apart from the weather and the various actors, the material is also allowed to be changeable and multiple, uh, mobile. It almost seems as if a material fatigue is quite desirable. The materials previously taken from their natural formation and arranged in a creative way are again consciously exposed by Dieter Roth and the life cycles of nature. Here are some more details. So, but I, I will show you now a collage with the growing of the sculpture. The garden is particular on this project in this respect. The outdoor sculpture should itself produce yeah, all these processes. Um, perhaps this is more clear. I made a little timeline so you can see when it started and how it goes on. Exhibited in Vienna, for example, in the Secession in 1995, which, or you know, is indoor, a juice machine was added in front of the Secession. And so in Hamburg, real rabbits, but also rabbits made of um, carnicle excrements were added to the installation. So these processes of cycle and um, no remains got got more and more place in this installation. And I come back to this organic so-called art juice. So when the installation was in Hamburger Bahnhof, you can see that this is the juice machine we had outside of the museum and all the garbage and rubbish from the installation work came into these and together with the rain became an art juice and we were, these are the collected glasses from all the other exhibition stations like Marseille, Paris, etc. And here I just wanted to say you a picture of our daily work we had to do in this exhibition place. I will, yeah, just some little signs. In Berlin there came also this table 
They added the table to the installation where the visitors shall paint and work, and we, uh, they ask us to, so the studio ask us to collect all the products and order them in, and put them in chronological order in these files. Um, yeah, so I come to the end and try a summary of our work and our thoughts about this. I have tried to show these ongoing process in some of Dieter Roth's work, but also how the inclusion of the ephemeral and transient begins to the documentation of these processes. In his works, rotting and decay are not something that is not be stopped, that is to be stopped. It's placed in the cycle of life and knows no remains. One of Roth's most important statements on the decomposition and decay of his work is certainly the following one. I think it was this one. Um, certainly the following one. There is a gradual showing down of the decay. After all, the pictures will outlive me. And the pictures retain a certain standard even if they point to decay. They then press for a temporal stop. They hold on as an image, even so they may perish as matter. The quite broken, rotten picture actually rises, gets more and more museum life. We, whereas a museum has always been more or less a funerary institute for me. So this central question of preservation now, of course, accompanies Dieter Roth's entire oeuvre. Even if the work has long since been absorbed and entered into a museum context and the staff of experts could make a um, long life installation care possible, as long as it involved an identical iteration. It is on one hand the family performance that needs to be clarified in this meaning, as an authorship and participation, but also the interaction of the museum people is involved. Um, yeah. The garden sculpture is the work in which each iteration, and perhaps I um, forgot to say this, that um, also it, it belongs to the museum, to the National Gallery, but we, the family always come to install it. So now his sons and his grandsons are always with us when we, when we install it. And um, yeah, but it's also the abandon of a notion of autographic work, or better to accept that this is not the materialization of an unchanging object. The fact of movement of liveliness makes the spectrum of stakeholders manifold. The processual has broken down the closed concept of the work and therefore foregrounds intermediate networking and continu continuation. In a way, the performance here is the maintenance and the continuation of the garden sculpture. An interactive map could be an image of how the individual media and features can be defined and related, after which the respective material and immaterial intention could be determined. Thus evoking the active care and entertainment of the various co-worker who have been involved in the long and unfinished creation of the garden sculpture for almost now 50 years. So, the handling over of care, which is not tied to the material alone, first to the Beatles, you remember the quotation I quoted at the beginning, later to family and museum guarantees a never completed immaterial, immaterial concept of memory. And um, yeah. And allow me to come to the end. The reflection on documentation and recording in your Rotting Sounds project, and we heard today, could provide many ideas for our further handling of these kind of works in the conservational field, whose performative and interactive elements should not disappear. So, thank you very much for your patience. Oh, I, I forgot something, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, if there is any question from the audience, we would love to hear them. Yes? Thank you, Caroline. That's very interesting. I would be quite interested 
um, uh, the decision processes of uh, this uh, caretaking process. I mean, uh, for example, it seems to me that the you got instructions how to perform with the garden sculpture in that case. Um, but I think there are many, like in the daily practice, there are many questions that arise, right, from how to deal with uh, certain things, whether to keep them intact, how to, uh, to control them or letting them loose. How, I mean, in an institution like Hamburger Bahnhof, how does it work, or in your team, how does that work? Yeah, thank you for this question. I think this was one of the central points when I started to think about what we are doing. Because we got these instructions, but they were not really defined. So we had to cook these juice, we have to grow the plants outside the museum, we have to give water to the plants inside the installation. But all these, all these works we did with taking Polaroids, writing a date, so all these questions this came to me. So with which pen I shall write it? What shall I photograph? So that was very unclear and undefined. And so that was the moment I uh, realized that we become to, yeah, in a way, in a way co-workers for this project. And um, yeah, I start thinking about documentation and what, what is the documentation now which belongs to the work? Is it what we do or is it the family archive we got as the rules with the work? So. It's, um, I think it's a point we always have to discuss new. And I have no clear answer on this. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the audience? I have a question. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, this uh, Vogelfutter boost, it's like, I uh, didn't get, maybe I missed one point, but is it like uh, still in the garden or is it is getting more and more destroyed? Or what is, uh, and one, one day it's not going to exist anymore. Did I understand it right or how it works? I would be very interested. Yeah, that's, just, uh, that's a good question. And I, prob I think my pictures were not really clear, but here you can see it above right, you can see it. This is actually the heart of the whole sculpture. It was here inside this crate. Oh, yeah. And then it was more and more eaten by the birds. And now it's in this huge inside piece anywhere in the depots of the National Gallery. But it's just the, the, yeah, the, the wooden base okay. left. Mm -hmm. And also the, yeah. Well, yeah, you, thank you, Carolina. You, you, you said that you were somehow becoming co-workers. So I'm asking myself whether this is also um, a kind of artwork where the authorship is put into question. So the, the, the artist author. And uh, to what extent in, in, in this work, but also in, in what we have seen today or heard, <laughs> Um, it, yeah, there are other forces that take authorship, so to speak. So decay as such is becoming a kind of author. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the artist is, is, um, doesn't, cannot claim the kind of originality or mastership or things like that anymore. So what are your, are your thoughts about that? Or maybe also the others have something to say about it. Yeah, I think the authorship is also a central question because first it was him, then on the certificate we got with the work in the museum, it is him and his son. Now these are the grandsons, but yeah, at the same time I say everything, uh, in, yeah, everything inscribes into the material of the sculpture, so we yeah, the authors, um, it's a ongoing certificate in a way. So we have, I don't know how we handle this, if the certificate has to be made new one day, the authorship and the situation. So many open questions concerning to this installation work. 
Thank you so much. And just uh, again, the usual reminder, you can write further questions and comment on the post-it that you find outside. Uh, Caroline will join us for the panel discussion later. Uh, but I would like to um, ask um, Almut, maybe you have a question since you know each other very well. Yeah, thank you so much for this enlightening talk. And um, bonding to your question, I would be interested how it's like um, considering authorship and originality of the artwork, how is the institution as a museum getting along with this? Because, you know, they are um, considering the museum as a kind of archive, there are different roles and there is kind of hierarchy. So there are the curators, there is the director, there are the conservators, there are the whatever. So how is the discussion between those roles within the institution, how to deal with this artwork? Because in this case, it might be clearer because there are instructions, but still I can imagine that there are discussions going on, how to basically. Yeah, I think this, that would be the best if this, if this is a discussion in the whole, in the whole team. With, we have this colleague, Eisbrand Hummelen, and I never forget a, in a lecture, he showed this, um, he shown a, a, an image with um, um, acquisition in the museum, a new acquisition in the museum, and a group of people around, and then was always on the head of everyone was the, was the, yeah, the profession inside the museum. So there was a technician, the director, they were all together, and the whole team has to decide how to go on with, with the project, because everybody is involved in the daily practice. So, yeah, we should. I think we we have also we as conservators have to open this discussion and try to get answers and yeah, try to work together. Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Uh, just a comment, maybe, because you said we should join in. But I think that's exactly the beauty of the project that it makes obvious what is inherent in so many other projects as well. These questions about authorship and maybe interpretation, observation. So I think it's not the only project that deals exactly with these types of questions. But here it is really obvious, and it's a good um, chance to, to think and about it and discuss these issues. Because yeah. they are so obvious here, thank or more obvious. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and at some time, the, the conservation itself stops the artwork as well. So if it's a process-based work like the the, uh, the buste, it's stopped. And it, maybe it was intended by the artist that it should disappear in the end, but the conservation, in a way, stops this process of rotting. So this brings yeah. all the questions up. These are these are all our questions. Also, in the moment, in the moment, you get it into an indoor room because it's not raining in a mm. museum. So. How can we produce this art juice if we don't have an open outside space? Yeah. So many questions. But um, bringing it back in the garden is, is also an, perhaps no solution. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But I think documenta documenting and um, this kind of discussion, thinking together about did, um, yeah, let us come, come as nearer to a solution. Oh. And also, Ruth changed the kind of his view because when he became older, he was more and more open to being preserved a little bit more. You know, <laughs> he was young and he was like completely um, um, convinced by his idea, which is great. And, with, and he became older and older, and he kind of started thinking about his legacy or something, his heritage. And then he got more um, addicted to the idea to be a little bit more preserving with all this. Things, but but still, you can see in a lot of museums like this, deadly preserved artworks. So, and this is still a shame. Thomas, I can throw in an anecdote from the beginning of Rotting Sounds. Almut has known this uh, Namchung Pike uh, sculpture, media sculpture at uh, uh, Straße. It's a subway station in Vienna, and uh, this sculpture has been left alone for 20, 15, 20 years or so. Yeah. And uh, the thing is that the rights holder doesn't care, but no one dares, dares to touch it because the legal situation is unclear, so it's basically it's left alone. We wanted to kind of rework it in, in our own terms, but uh, the, uh, so to say, the, the owners, which is the subway uh, 
institution here, they don't dare to do anything with it. So it's basically, <laughs> that's actually the perfect situation for a rot because no one comes close or dares to change anything. But I think it was not as intended by an Amtung Pike, right? Even though the name of the artwork is Tele Archaeology. Yeah, yeah. So it basically would kind of fit to just leave it there mm. as it is. Yeah, then thank you so much. Um, we are going to have a um, 10 minutes break. Um, again, we're going to kindly ask you to leave the room for the change of air, and uh, you can get some coffee upstairs and write your questions on the post-it. Thank you so much. Thank you again.